Good morning, everybody. I'm Alice Cooper, and I'm the Corporate Partnerships Officer here at Autistica. So we're absolutely delighted to have you all here with us today. Thank you for joining us for this next session on diagnosis and women. So I'll be hosting this panel session all about diagnosis and autistic women. We know that throughout the history of autism, women have been underrecognized, underdiagnosed, and underserved. In the past decade, this inequality has begun to change as knowledge of autism in women has developed and grown. With this recognition, many women are now reflecting on their life experiences and understanding themselves through the scope and identity of autism. This session will explore autistic women's experience of diagnosis and post-diagnosis and how this relates to well-being, self-understanding and the life course. We are welcoming two brilliant presenters to this session, Miriam Harmons and Rosie Wilson, whose bios you can read just below this live stream, along with a PDF version of their slides, if you wish to see them in a different format. Miriam will be joining us for the live Q&A and Megan Freeth will be filling in for Rosie at the end of this session once their presentations are finished. You can submit your questions via the Q&A system just below this video. These will be collated by my Autistica colleagues and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Some of our presenters have agreed to let us share their email addresses if you have any further questions and we will put those in the Q&A system after the whole panel session has ended. So Miriam, please start us off. Hello and thank you for coming along to this session on diagnosis and autistic women today. My name is Miriam Harmons and I am a Laidlaw Scholarship alum from the University of York. The studies I will discuss today were completed as part of my Laidlaw Scholarship under the supervision of Dr Hannah Hobson from the University of York and Dr Felicity Sedgwick from the University of Bristol. In today's presentation, I will discuss the research I conducted looking at autistic women's diagnostic experiences and the interactions between these and autistic women's well-being and identity. I will cover both the studies that I conducted, exploring their results and concluding what this tells us. Research has shown that autistic women can often present differently to autistic men, and this can mean that their autism is diagnosed later in their lifetimes or altogether missed. Additionally, autistic individuals can have greater risk of co-occurring mental health problems compared to the general population. Therefore, this first study that we conducted aimed to intersect these two topics, exploring the roles of well-being and mental health during autistic women's self-identification and or diagnostic periods. The methodology we used to conduct this research project was a qualitative design whereby we conducted a thematic analysis on the work of 24 online bloggers. The participants were bloggers who were women over the age of 13 and they had to either self-identify as autistic or disclose a diagnosis of autism. The blogs had to be written in English and surround their experiences of the diagnostic journey or their thoughts around the diagnostic journey. The results of our first study are summarised within three themes we generated, depicted here in the thematic map within the black boxes. The grey boxes are the aspects of these themes which contributed towards a positive well-being for these women whilst the white ellipses include aspects which have caused a negative impact on autistic women's well-being. The first theme of self-understanding and self-acceptance considers how making sense of what happened to them and that what happened in their past through the diagnosis had a positive impact on autistic women's well-being and how diagnosis helped them to understand their difficulties and treat themselves kinder. When considering aspects of self-understanding and self-acceptance which contributed towards a negative well-being for these women, not knowing about their autism could lead to self-esteem and identity problems and post-diagnosis feelings of imposter syndrome or not fitting the diagnosis had a negative impact on well-being. This theme is summarised within the quote here from one of the blogs. The relief and empowerment I felt when I was diagnosed and finally discovered what was wrong with me was overwhelming. It literally gave me a second life. The second theme of being accepted and understood by others considers how improving relationships and having a community of autistic individuals around you can improve well-being. The aspects of this theme which contributed towards a negative well-being for autistic women, pre-diagnosis, 
were not knowing about their autism, which left them vulnerable, and that fears around acceptance actually impacted them seeking a diagnosis. At all points in the journey towards autism and diagnosis, striving to fit in was something these women did, and this was painful. Furthermore, a lack of professional knowledge or misdiagnoses negatively impacted their well-being throughout their journey. And finally, facing autistic stereotypes from society had a negative impact on these women's well-being. This theme is summarised in the following quote from one of the blogs. Being an undiagnosed autistic can feel like the whole world is gaslighting you. From being told not to be silly, the lights aren't hurting you. You're being told every day that your lived experience isn't real. There have certainly been times that I've doubted my sanity. Our final theme of exhaustion summarises how all the aspects that I have just discussed can lead to exhaustion for autistic women. Additionally, we consider how breaking points are often what led to identification for these women. This is, they'd reached exhaustion. This is summarised in the following quote. My chameleon skills were a double-edged sword. I could appear fairly normal for stretches of time, but they also drained me completely. I became so many different people that I felt I'd lost any sense of my own identity. From the results of our first study, we concluded that acceptance plays a key role in the autistic women's well-being throughout their diagnostic journey from self-identity to diagnosis and beyond. And our findings suggest that the extent to which diagnosis positively impacts autistic women's well-being really does depend on the level of acceptance both personally and by others of that diagnosis. As our first study found that acceptance plays a key role in well-being surrounding the autistic diagnosis for women, we wanted to conduct a follow-up study allowing us to explore in more detail the interaction between diagnosis, well-being and identity for autistic women. A key part of this second study is that we had three groups of autistic women, those who were self-identifying or awaiting diagnosis, those who were undergoing diagnosis or had just been diagnosed within the past year, and then finally those who had been diagnosed longer. We decided to do this as much research has focused on diagnosed autistic women alone, thereby we feel missing the experiences of those self-identifying or awaiting their diagnosis. The methodology we used for this study was mixed. We first put out a survey online which measured autistic traits, well-being and autistic identity, and this survey was completed by 96 autistic women. A subsample of these women signed up at the end of the survey to participate in an interview. We had 24 autistic women participate in interviews altogether. Again, our participants were women based in the UK. They had to be over 18 years old, and then depending on which group they were in, they were either self-identifying or diagnosed as autistic. The results from our second study are summarised in the following thematic map, whereby we see the overarching theme of searching for validation with four sub-themes which interact with this theme and with each other. The theme of searching for validation shows how diagnosis can have a positive impact on both autistic women's well-being and their identity through validating their identities and autistic women and their experiences. This can be seen in the following quote from one of the women. I guess for me, diagnosis is kind of the validation I'm after of this identity that I found for myself. I kind of feel like I want it to feel more legitimate. Our first sub-theme of Don't Forget I'm Autistic considers how identity and well-being can both be impacted by the extent to which services accommodate for and accept autistic women's traits and how autistic women's traits can interact with well-being and identity throughout the diagnostic journey. One woman said, it's been a kind of struggle. There's a lot of anxiety and a lot of uncertainty as how I'm going to navigate the world with this new identity. Our second sub theme of what now considers how well-being and identity can negatively be impacted by long waiting times and feelings of limbo pre-diagnosis. Post-diagnosis, this is again seen as women report a lack of support, which can be confusing and traumatic. One woman in the interviews said, I got diagnosed and then I had like one post-diagnostic session. 
it would have just been nice i don't know just to just to know i felt like i was diagnosed and not just waved off on my way our third sub theme of having to be the professional encapsulates how identity and well-being can be lessened by a lack of support from professionals. This includes autistic women's experiences of disbelief and dismissal by healthcare professionals. One woman in the interviews told us, it feels very much like the onus is on you as an individual to make the assessment happen rather than a medical practitioner saying, this is something that we should see or we should, you know, just any kind of update or any kind of knowledge that they sent you a referral and you've not heard anything back. And finally, the sub theme of no one saw me shows how identity and well-being can negatively be impacted for autistic women by their autism not being recognised at a younger age. Identity can be also negatively impacted by the societal stereotypes surrounding autism. This is seen in the following quote. I think before it was that everyone seems to have that kind of image of the typical autistic person like Sherlock Holmes or Sheldon Cooper. And if you don't identify with that, you're probably not autistic. From the results of this study, we concluded that autistic women are constantly seeking validation, both of themselves, but especially of their identity as an autistic individual. This happens both pre and post diagnosis and that the time post-diagnosis can continue to be traumatic and confusing as the autistic women come to learn more about and grow into their identity as autistic. Diagnosis for many of these women is seen as a validation of their autistic identity and an opportunity to validate themselves in the eyes of others due to having a piece of paper which states their diagnosis by a medical professional. From our two studies looking at the diagnostic experiences of autistic women, we concluded that throughout their diagnostic journey from self-identification to diagnosis and beyond, autistic women experience high levels of exhaustion which negatively impact their well-being as they search for acceptance and understanding and a validation of their autistic identity. The following slide just shows some references which I used during this presentation and at the bottom you can see a reference to this paper which we wrote about our first study. I can post the links to any of these studies in the chat. I just wish to extend my heartfelt thanks to all the autistic women who have written blogs and shared them on the internet and to every single autistic woman who participated in our online questionnaire and interview study. This research would not have happened without you. I wish to also thank the Laidlaw Scholarship for supporting my research, especially the team at the University of York, and both my supervisors and co-authors, Hannah and Felicity. Finally, I thank you for your time and interest in my research, and I'll now hand over to the chair of the session who will introduce you to the next panel presentation. Please save any of your questions you may have on my work until the end of the session, where I will more than happily answer them in the live Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam. That was an absolutely fantastic presentation. Loved hearing the quotes directly from the autistic women that partook in the study themselves, and especially the highlighting of the need for acceptance and validation throughout the diagnosis journey. So next up, we have Rosie. Thank you, Rosie, over to you. Hi, my name's Rosie Wilson, and this is my research. Autistic women's experiences of self-compassion after receiving their diagnosis in adulthood. And this study was submitted as part of my clinical psychology doctoral thesis. This is a team involved with the research. Um, so myself from the University of Sheffield, alongside Dr. Georgina Rouse, also a clinical psychologist working at the University of Sheffield, Dr. Megan Freeth, um, a senior lecturer in psychology from the University of Sheffield. Dr Richard Smith, clinical psychologist from Sheffield Adult Autism Neurodevelopmental Service and Professor Andrew Thompson, also a clinical psychologist at the Cardiff University. So thinking about the rationale for the study, 
why do we want to know about autistic women's experiences of self-compassion after receiving the diagnosis in adulthood? Well, there's a number of reasons. Firstly, there's limited research about autistic women's experiences of gaining a diagnosis. The research that is available suggests that females experience significant barriers to receiving an autism diagnosis compared to males and that females tend to be diagnosed with autism later in life than males. A barrier to diagnosis can be the use of compensatory strategies to mask or camouflage any difficulties. These strategies can take significant cognitive and emotional effort and negatively impact on mental health. Research highlights that autistic people often experience mental health issues with one study reporting that as many as 79% of autistic adults met the diagnostic criteria for a mental health condition. Self-compassion research is rapidly growing due to its strong link with mental health and psychological benefits, but there's limited research specifically exploring the benefits of self-compassion or self-compassion generally in autistic populations. So what do we mean by self-compassion? Self-compassion is defined by NEF as compromising three interrelated elements. Self-kindness versus self-judgment. Common humanity versus isolation. And mindfulness versus over-identification. Research suggests that cultivating self-compassion and compassion for others promotes resilience, well-being and social connection. So considering existing research about the challenges autistic women face in obtaining their diagnosis and the co-occurrence of mental health issues in autistic populations, this study aims to investigate autistic women's experiences of receiving their diagnosis in adulthood and whether receiving their diagnosis has influenced their perception of self-compassion. So this brings me on to the method. 11 autistic women were interviewed about their experiences of receiving the diagnosis in adulthood and their experiences of self-compassion. The interview questions were developed from previous research findings and also service user involvement that helped to provide advice regarding the accessibility of language, terminology and consideration of ethical and methodological issues. The participants were recruited from a local NHS diagnostic service and also from a university based research lab. All the interviews were conducted remotely via telephone or video call due to the COVID restrictions at the time of the study. The interview transcripts um, were then systematically analysed using IPA to reveal common themes in the participants' experiences. This table um, summarises some of the information about the participants all the names are pseudonyms to protect confidentiality and um, so as you can see you've got the age um, that the participant was at the time of the interview in the study and the time that had passed since they'd received their autism diagnosis. For participants to be eligible to um, say that they wanted to take part they had to self-identify as to whether they met the study requirements which were that they'd received a clinical autism diagnosis and that was after their 18th birthday, that they were cisgender female as well. Participants were excluded if they lacked the capacity to provide consent, if they were unable to speak English, and also if they didn't have access to the internet, because um, due to the COVID restrictions at the time, consent had to be obtained electronically. So once the interviews were um, conducted, the interviews were then transcribed. 
Those transcripts um, were analysed using IPA to identify common themes in the participants' experiences. Um, and through that process, three superordinate themes emerged. Uh, the first one is disconnect between the autistic self and experience of societal expectations. The second one is unmasking, the process of self-understanding. And the third one is impact on relationships. And each of the superordinate themes included sub-themes that you can see in this table. So this superordinate theme explores participants' experiences of feeling different from neurotypical expectations, which created feelings of rejection and frustration for the participants. And here's some of the quotes from this superordinate theme. Um, so for example, one from Karen. Being left-handed in a right-handed world, I've been in a neurotypical world and people have been trying to treat me and condition me as if I was neurotypical and I'm not. Another one from Angela. So many straight jackets and so much rigidity, most of it unspoken. This superordinate theme considers how participants' autism diagnosis facilitated greater self-understanding and provided a new lens to look back on their difficult past experiences. So here's some of the quotes from this superordinate theme. Um, and there's one from Juliet. Why am I like this? This little voice told me. And now it's like I understand what I'm going through and I can sort of de-escalate it quicker. It's like I'm accepting of who I am, whereas before I wasn't at all. This superordinate theme explores the impact on participants' relationships post-diagnosis, exploring reflections on diagnosis disclosure and shared experiences of autism. There's some quotes um, on this slide. And I'll read one from Juliet. I'm starting to accept myself, so I feel comfortable saying it now. So from um, this research, some of the conclusions we can draw. So previous research suggests that neurotypical women have lower levels of self-compassion than neurotypical men. This current study suggests that self-compassion could be even more reduced in autistic women, particularly when undiagnosed. Unhelpful thinking styles, social rejection and common misconceptions of autism were often reported as barriers to self-compassion. Participants felt difference aligns with NEF's um, definition, isolation over common humanity, again highlighting how that's a barrier to the development of self-compassion. Comparatively, most participants reported that their diagnosis did generate self-kindness and self-understanding, aligning with Neff's definition of self-compassion. And for some participants, receiving their diagnosis also developed compassion towards others, and that involved providing a greater understanding of other autistic people's needs. This included some participants um, chose to work with other autistic people, while other participants considered whether their family members might also meet the diagnostic criteria. And thinking in that way helped explain um, some of their previous interpersonal challenges. Participants also reported increased autonomy post-diagnosis and a greater confidence to feel able to assert their needs. So thinking about the clinical implications, this study suggests that late diagnosis equates to more years of social challenges, adding to the feelings of isolation and detrimental impact on mental health. This emphasises the importance of early identification to reduce the risks associated with low self-compassion and potential mental health symptoms. 
Participants describe the process of adjusting to their diagnosis and learning new ways of self-relating as an ongoing process, um, which highlights the importance of post-diagnostic support. Findings from this current study suggest that self-compassion interventions could support and enhance autistic women's well-being. Future research may wish to explore autistic women's experiences of diagnosis and self-compassion from other ethnic backgrounds, as all the participants in this study identified as white. Further research may also wish to explore the effectiveness of self-compassion based therapeutic interventions to improve autistic women's well-being. Thank you for your time and interest in my research. I'll now hand over to the chair of this session who will introduce the next panel presentation. Please save any questions you may have for my work until the end of the session or I'll gladly answer them in the live Q&A. So much Rosie, that was absolutely phenomenal. Really interesting to hear more in depth about the explorations of autistic women's feelings of difference, how unmasking can impact them, and then the impact this has on their self understanding. So we're now going to move on to our Q&A session. So let's welcome our speakers into the webinar. Hi there, Miriam. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Megan, how are you doing? Hi, right, nice to see you, Alice and everyone. You too. Well, thank you both so much for giving us your valuable time today. We really appreciate it. Um, Miriam, thank you so much for that fabulous presentation. And Megan, thank you as well for stepping in on Rosie's behalf to be here. So I'll go straight to the questions if that's okay. Fabulous. So Miriam, I've got a question for you in the first place. So, um, Miriam, thanks. The sample size of the study is small. Do you have plans to extend the study at all? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, yes, yeah, so the study was completed, as I said, as part of my Laidlaw scholarship. So because of that, we were limited on time and resources. Um, I would love to extend the study um, and look at different areas of identity and well-being for autistic women, as I think there's a lot more research that should and could be done in this area. Um, if and when that will ever happen um, is another question, um, but hopefully yeah, in the near future, I or someone else will extend the study to include uh, more participants and different views as well. Thank you, Miriam. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure everyone would love to extend their study. <laughs> That's fabulous. Right, so next question um, for both of you, actually. So um, as far as you're aware, is there any research relating to autistic women's experiences during pregnancy? Um, so Megan, if we could hear from you first, that'd be wonderful. Sure, um, I think that's a really important question. Um, and I think there's been a little bit of work done on that, but um, we're actually um, doing a study on that right now. Um, wow. so, <laughs> So um, uh, another one of my clinical doctoral students um, has been interviewing uh, women recently over the last couple of months about their experiences of pregnancy, um, and she's been doing her study in a similar style to um, Rosie's. So again, it's using IPA, the very in-depth interviews, and that'll be a very kind of reflective analysis um, where the researcher tries to, you know, and really in-depth understand um, the interpretation of the, the person's individual experiences. And I think this will be really um, you know, it's a really important area to try to understand as, you know, certainly with some other interviews that we've been having, you know, people were talking about that experience of pregnancy, but we didn't have the chance to go into it in, in a lot of depth. And yeah. so this is why we had Charlotte's study that's been really looking at that in depth um, over the last couple of months. And so she'll be uh, writing it up, um, yeah, over the next six months or so. So hopefully we'll be able to um, share that with you at the festival next year. How exciting and what a timely study for this for this question. Amazing. <laughs> Miriam, do you have anything to add to that? I was just going to echo what um, Megan said there that, yeah, it was actually something that we heard a lot in my interview study. Um, naturally, with a lot of the women being adults, um, several of them had been through pregnancy and childbirth. Um, but obviously that wasn't uh, the focus of the study. So I think there is more research at the minute. Um, I've heard of another study as well that is looking into being able to conduct research into pregnancy and postpartum experiences for autistic women. Um, 
I think along with much research into autism and healthcare, it's sort of only just starting. So watch this space, I would say. Amazing, thank you both. Right, next question. Um, and again, this is for both of you. So um, we know that anxiety is reported to be a lot higher in autistic women and girls than comparatively um, to autistic men and boys or even non-autistic people. Do you have any recommendations for how we might address this? And Megan, if we could go to you first. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, anxiety, it's, you know, such a, a big and important issue. And I think, you know, there can be many reasons why somebody's experiencing anxiety. Um, and I think it was quite interesting. I th I prob probably most people have heard um, Sven's uh, presentation beforehand, you know, taking a very individualized approach, I think is really important really to try to understand, you know, a holistic view of a, an individual rather than kind of trying to treat individual difficulties separately. Um, I think that would be something that would be, be really important and hopefully we'll be able to start to move um, forward on in a, in a very proactive way. Um, but yeah, anxiety is it's really important, very, very, very large um, issue. But I think there are many reasons that somebody um, would experience anxiety. And some of them are personal to the individual, but there's a lot of kind of society contextual factors that can um, really contribute to that. And so when thinking about how to help someone, it's really important to take everything into account, I think. Yeah, that's such a good answer. I think it's so important to have that holistic approach, absolutely. Miriam, what about you? your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think I would echo as well that the holistic approach is super important and looking at the individual and not just, you know, any labels or, um, you know, diagnoses they have. Um, but I guess from the research that I conducted, we did find that well-being did interact with sort of self-understanding and self-acceptance, and also understanding and acceptance from others. And so um, being able to have that understanding and be able to feel confident in your own identity and in, in your own self. Um, I believe can really um, support uh, well-being and so that will naturally um, what anxiety can be a part of well-being for many people so I guess through increasing uh, understanding and awareness in society and more generally but also for individuals who are autistic or think they might be autistic um, that might be one way that we could sort of go towards increasing well-being including anxiety more generally. Amazing, thank you both. So another question for us, we've got a lot rolling in, so it's, I'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, so again, love to hear both of your thoughts on this. So what do you think women should do when they're facing long diagnostic waits and potentially stressful diagnostic processes? And just to mix things up, Miriam, shall we hear from you first? <laughs> Yeah, so that's a great question. That's something that we heard a lot in my second research study where we conducted interviews with autistic women and hopefully the paper for that um, is on its way out. So hopefully that will have some you know, suggestions or answers. Uh, but one thing we found that lots of women said that was helpful to them was doing research and doing a lot of reading and actually joining communities such as the online Twitter community um, to find out, although these communities will have some negative aspects a lot of the women said that the um, self-identifying women on that community were really sort of powerful and helpful to them in their identity um, and it just I think something very important was just being in contact with the healthcare professionals lots of women said this is something they have to do themselves and sort of taking on like I said the role of the professional um, but not being afraid to, you know, if you're not sure what's happening, give someone a call and try and get some answers. It is a very stressful period um, and it, it can be really long waits, especially if you're looking for an NHS diagnosis. But I think if you can do something to understand more about autism or how you might relate and how that being autistic might relate to you, that was something that really came through as what might be helpful for wellbeing and identity. Brilliant. Thank you. How about you, Megan? What would you recommend? Yeah, I think it's just such a terrible, terribly, ter terribly challenging thing you know, to be on a waiting list for, for such a long time. And unfortunately, it's a really common experience at the moment. Um, I think um, kind of if you self-identify as being autistic, you know, but, you, you know, you haven't managed to 
um, get to the diagnostic appointment, then it, it can still be really helpful to look for local groups as well as online groups. Um, you know, a lot of local groups will be, you know, kind of accepting and welcoming people who do self-identify. And some, because I think the process of coming to understand a diagnosis and processing the meaning of it takes a really long time and so for some people it might be helpful to you know start to um you know join some things and maybe just you know attend occasionally or just for a short amount of time or with support of another person um it's just another thought that I had on top of what miriam said which is already lots of very helpful suggestions yeah absolutely so maybe something about being your own health advocate in doing the research but also looking for what peer support might be available both online and in your local context. Thank you both. So I'll move us on to another question. So, and a question for both of you again. Um, how research and scientific knowledge in the autism area, how do we think that can support autistic individuals um, to stop having self-compassion um, and develop and in addition to that, develop self-confidence. Sorry, that's a, 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 an interestingly worded question there. <laughs> I might try to reframe that. Um, so if we're looking at research and scientific knowledge in, in the area of autism, how can we support autistic individuals? Um, I think they might have meant to start um, having self-compassion and develop um self-confidence um so Miriam if we could hear from you first please yeah that's a great question I think um I'm not a clinical psychologist so I'm in no means uh, sort of qualified to give recommendations on sort of more practical elements but from the research that I've conducted um I would suggest that confidence um and self-compassion for lots of the women I spoke to really came from building an identity for themselves and an understanding of themselves. Um, so being able to understand how their experiences relate to being autistic or any traits they might identify with um, really enabled them to be able to look into themselves and think, OK, this isn't just me feeling wrong or being wrong um, and not putting that pressure on themselves to conform to societal expectations of what a woman should be like or you know whatever you, um, expectation you're conforming to and just giving yourself that freedom to actually this is the reality for me and this is how I can best make um, use of my traits and my experiences to understand myself and become more myself um, and I think it's really rooted in that self-acceptance and self-understanding um, that we heard that the confidence and Sort of compassion towards yourself came from. Brilliant, thank you. And how about you, Megan? Um, yeah, I think in relation to thinking about how to develop self-compassion, I think it can be quite helpful to think of that um, kind of theoretical model that Rosie mentioned in her presentation. So that's NERF's model. So they kind of break it down into three separate parts. So it's kind of a focus on self-kindness, um, a focus on Kind of common humanity or maybe kind of finding your your group your community or you know others that you kind of um, empathize with and you know for everyone that would be different um, and then also kind of focusing on mindfulness so kind of trying to staying in the moment and um, so those kind of three key things can help um, people to develop their um, self-compassion um, and certainly in Rose's research um, she was finding that in general um, women were um, describing that going through that process of diagnosis and receiving a diagnosis did help them with with developing that and it's something that's been you know alluded to in, in some of our earlier research projects that was looking at, at women that you know develop uh, that uh, receive their diagnosis in older adulthood um but yeah i think it's it's something that can be really useful to to kind of develop and, and focus on and that can um uh, in certain circumstances improve people's quality of life amazing thank you both so um i'm gonna round us off with one final question now and it's quite a big one um so feel free to have you know, a little, a little longer answer, more in depth. Um, so what would you like to see change in society to support 
autistic women better throughout the diagnosis and post diagnosis processes. So Miriam, if you'd like to kick us off, that'd be wonderful. Wow, that's an amazing question. Um, how long have we got? Oh, <laughs> um, I know. I think, Go for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think one thing we found uh, a lot in interview study that we conducted was seeing autistic women in the media. Um, so for lots of the autistic women, kept coming back to Rain Man, Sherlock Holmes, Sheldon Cooper. Those are sort of the three big characters within sort of modern media that are seen in popular culture as autistic um the stereotypical view um and I think for lots of these women they'd actually got to a point of self-identifying or recognizing that they're autistic when they'd heard um other autistic women talking in the media um so for example I know Christine McGivis did that program uh was it last year late in the year I believe about um her experience yeah. and having the reality of actually what it means to be autistic and not in a cartoon or comical sense um and not for entertainment purposes but just the reality and seeing your experiences um portrayed I think that was something that was reported to us to be really helpful um for many of these autistic women um and then I guess I think um society more general but especially within healthcare and social care uh just so I don't it's very cliche but so much more training needed um because a lot of these women are reporting that difficulties often stem from health and social care and this should be the place where these women are able to go for support and to be you know listened to and heard um but when you're hearing stories um, as we did, where they're feeling that they're having to be the professional, that their autistic traits are not accommodated for, that there isn't a clear pathway for diagnosis, that there isn't a clear way to get access to support. Um, that's really then what's going to be putting a big strain on well-being. Um, and I think so having a greater understanding within health and social care of what it means to be autistic, but especially a, an autistic woman and someone seeking a diagnosis in adulthood so that you're not losing that validation from the health and social care side um, would be a massive benefit for autistic women and autistic individuals more generally as well. Amazing. I'm, I'm right there with you. Thank you <laughs> Megan, if you'd like to finish us off, that'd be wonderful. Uh, sure, yeah, to just build on what Miriam said, all of which I agree with, I think just the two really key things are um, improving understanding and improving acceptance, um, you know, and there are so many different ways that we can do this, and but they're just, you know, both so important, um, you know, in terms of understanding, you know, this can be at, you know, people in all different spheres, as Miriam's uh, mentioned, you know, people working in health and social care that often comes up, you know, it comes up again and again and again. And it's even, you know, it's people who, you know, are supposed to be specialists in certain areas, but, you know, autistic women report to us that there is still a lot of, um, you know, misconceptions, misunderstanding, you know, not taking things, um, you know, properly in the, in into context, um, you know, and, and then more, more generally, potentially, you know, people working in things like GP practices, you know, there's a lot of additional training that's needed there to improve understanding, um, but in, in all different areas, really, you know, I think in general understanding at a societal level has been improving over the last, say, 10, 20 years, but I think there's a, still a long way to go and there's more that, um, yeah, there's, there's just a lot of scope for improvement there. Um, but outside of understanding just improvements in acceptance um, mm. can just be so helpful just accepting difference and you know that people have different experiences different things to bring to the table and just kind of celebrating that I think those you know that's just such an important thing so those would be the really two key things for me I think. Incredible thank you so much for sharing that and I think in terms of the acceptance piece we've seen a massive shift in that just this year with the change in name of World Autism Awareness Month to World Autism Acceptance Month because there's a recognition within lots of autistic um, communities and families that that's where we need to be heading. Um, so really glad to hear that you're echoing that as well. Um, well, that brings us to the end of our Q&A session. Um, thank you so much, um, Miriam and Megan. 
and to Rosie as well for her fantastic presentation. Um, I believe um, we're going to have Miriam and Megan's email addresses put into the Q&A system now um, if you would like to get in touch with them to ask any further questions. Um, but I'd just like to say to all attendees, to our, our wonderful speakers and panel, thank you so much for joining this session. Um, if you'd like to join us for the next session, that begins at 1pm and we'd be delighted to see you. Um, however, we will be recording all of our sessions and putting them on YouTube within the next month if you aren't able to make that session. Um, so all that remains for me to say is I hope you all have a delicious lunch and we'll see you all very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.